the affirmative. This first part, we're calling it that young AF life. Because that's what it is. <laughs> so we're going to be going over how to understand the sociocultural factors that make for winning an affirmative in debates. All right. This is our objective. Similar to that first statement that we just went over. Um, and objectives are here just so that you know what our goals is for this particular session. So if you ever wonder why are we doing this, what is the what are what are, what should I be looking for to see if I've gotten the information I'm supposed to be understanding by the conclusion of this week's meeting. So the goal is for you to be able to identify what sociocultural values influence how affirmatives are created, evaluated, debated, and defeated. Right. Let's understand that. There's a lot of words there. So let's break this down and see exactly where this uh, applies to uh, affirmatives. So sociocultural, this is an important word in that sentence. Sociocultural, uh, the definition that I like the best, I pulled this from the Cambridge Dictionary. You can find that online. Uh, it is an adjective, but sociocultural is related to the different groups of people in a society. Um, but for the purposes of debate, we'll just say in a group of people um, in their habits, traditions, and beliefs, okay? We're gonna take this def definition, we're going to apply these pieces, habits, traditions, and beliefs to the landscape of what we know that exists in debate for affirmatives. Uh, one of the things that I liked about the Cambridge Dictionary, this is just an aside, so that might be helpful in the future, is that it, it also shows you words, that are words and phrases that are related. So that when we're reading difficult texts, we know that we have certain skills that we can use or tactics we can use to break things down. So that if we know some of these words, like maybe I'm familiar with socio, maybe I'm familiar with societal, but I'm not familiar with sociocultural, I have some tools that I can utilize to then break it down and be able to have a deeper understanding of whatever the thing is that I'm reading. So this is just a tool that you can use when you're working on reading more difficult graduate level texts, like when you're reading about critiques or deep level policy analysis, you're gonna find times where you might get stumped. And so I like the Cambridge Dictionary just because it shows you words like this. And I'm sure other dictionary, uh, online dictionaries do this as well. But I just underlined some words that I thought were related that might be useful. Um, and, and we'll maybe talk about these more later. But what is a sociocultural, the socioculture in debate? So we know that sociocultural, uh, socioculture re relies on three different things, the groups of the different kinds of people who make up that environment and the traditions of those different groups of people that make up the environment. And then lastly, the habits, um, which is, which are, very connected though not the same as traditions and i'll break down the differences between um the two all three of these in just a moment so let's start out with the groups of people debate is made up of individuals we know that we are coming to this meeting representing the bay area urban debate league but amidst that we have all these different categories that we fall into so we're the bay area urban debate league but you might right now we only have oakland tech being represented in here Oh, everybody comes from different high schools and then are from different cities, are of different races, are of different ethnicities within those races, are of different genders, different class orientations, sexual orientations, and maybe of different geographical origins. So you might be someone who is from uh, Alaska, but you're living in the Bay Area Urban Debate League now, and you're also XYZ things. Intersectionality is real. There's a bunch of different people that have contributed to the beliefs in landscape of, uh, or sociocultural landscape of policy debate. But if we know certain things about the majority of the people who make up debate, who are those folks? Primarily um, young white men. Um, and this is at both the high school and the collegiate level, even though different groups that are of other uh, orientations of uh, gender and race um, are starting to be integrated into policy debate. The primary group of people who make up debate and thus influence how we would understand affirmatives are white men. So what are the traditions of all those groups that we were talking about before? So these are the, I've broken them down into three different groups that I've seen of ways that af affirmatives are kind of 
traditionally created. Um, the first is the shits, and many of us have heard of this before. Ha ha ha, shits, it sounds funny. It's a way for us to remember what are considered to be the requirements to construct an affirmative. So that would be solvency, harm, inherency, topicality, and significance. On the next slide, we'll get into what each of these steps mean. But for the purposes of this section, I just want to clarify that there are three different, from what I have experienced, three major types of ways or major traditions that affirmatives are created within. The second, I call them the creative shits, which is basically the difference between the first one and the second is that instead of it necessarily being uh, within the topic, it is topically relevant. And so an example of what this could look like on the 20, uh, 20, 21 school year resolution is an affirmative that addresses criminal justice reform generally, as opposed to the three planks that the resolution states that we need to address, which is sentencing, policing, and forensic science. An affirmative that is like maybe about abolition, uh, generally and not related to directly sentencing, policing, or forensics could be considered relevant to the topic, but not necessarily considered topical. So I would call that an example of a creative shift. Um, the last one is the radical ish. Now, the radical ish is the bare minimum of what is a traditional shit's model. So it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have topicality. And I, I, yeah, topicality is the, is the only one that we don't have. There should be two S's in that uh, ish that's in the PowerPoint. But it includes inherency, significance, solvency, and harms. But it is suggesting that there is something that takes precedence over the conversation that the resolution would provide us with. So be before we can even talk about uh, criminal justice reform, or uh, the theoretical aspects of the resolution that they want us to talk about, like in the world of fiat, there is something that we must deal with now. Now, typically, these kind of radical-ish apps are made about debate. They're suggesting that there is something that's happening either in the debate round, at the debate tournament, um, in the region, or in just like in general, what how what happens in debate, that there is something that is important for us to talk about, more important than the education that we would get from discussing the topic in any capacity, in a topical discussion or a topically relevant discussion. Um, so those are the three. And then for the last, the last section we got is the habits, which is that the habits of, of most of or, or the habits, I kind of describe it as being the majority view that affirmative for them to have, to be an offensive argument, um, as like for the affirmative to be an offensive argument, it must have at least, at the very least, inherency, significance, solvency, and harms. That's a, I, I would say that that is a general agreed upon stance, even if people have differing opinions on things like significance and solvency. Because those are major ones where people might disagree um, about if a particular affirmative meets the burden of being significant or meets the burden of being uh, of, of its claim for solvency. But the general standard is that it must have all four of these things for this to be an offensive affirmative that is able to win the debate. So let's have a basic understanding of what these, these the, the, the shits are so that when we apply them, to the affirmative with Jasmine, we know what we're looking for. So I, I just pulled this from Wikibooks. An easy way to try to remember or learn about new debate concepts is to start with doing your own research. Debate is a research-centric activity. And so when there are parts of it that we don't know, it's still helpful to you to utilize the skills that we would use in researching for the topic and researching about debate. Um, it's neat because we're join you're joining debate at a moment where it's ex existed for a very long time. So people have written articles, people have uh, written books, people have made documentaries, there's a Netflix movie. There's a lot of discussion about what things mean in debate. So if you don't know what it means, do a Google search, see what you come up with. I got to this page from just typing in like the shit's policy debate. And it gave some really concrete and precise or uh, concise 
definitions that I thought would be useful for us to go over today. So significant, how significant is the, pro the problem that you're trying to remedy through your interpretation of the re resolution? So to break down significance a little bit further, you 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 have to identify what makes something significant. Is it a is there some ethical reason why the the problem that you're trying to remedy is significant? Is there a economic reason why the problem that you're trying to solve of of the resolution is significant? And it could be multiple things at one time, but it is important for the affirmative to explain clearly. Even if you don't say this is the significance of the ask, you must clearly explain how the what, what is significant about what you're proposing so the second one is harms so what happens if your plan doesn't pass why do we need to do this plan right now so if you think of it kind of similar to a disad there's typically a time frame reason of why your plan is important because if it isn't you're you're more open to things like a counter plan being able to slide in there and say okay even if the app is important it's not we sh we don't need to do it right now and there's a uh there's something wrong with doing it at this particular moment so we should wait for this uh uh for whatever time frame to pass and then do the app so you'd be very susceptible to something like a time frame counter plan um and and that's regardless of whatever theoretical reasons you might come up with about why time frame counter plans are bad but you do have to have a reason why this plan needs to be happening right now so in you know this is that explanation is really helpful for the uh traditional shits that we're, we we discussed in on the previous slide but it's also helpful for the the creative shits um but for the for I would say the radical version, where it's just the that includes only inherency, solvency, significant, and harms, I would say that you you need to have an, a, a real reason about why dealing with the topic is not important. You know, like why you don't need to have either a topical discussion or a topic a dis, or a discussion of the topic that is not necessarily considered topical, but still would produce some kind of topic education. Because your harms need to be suggesting why topic education does not matter um, compared to the discussion that this affirmative would bring. So the third one is inherency. Um, this, these are often kind of confused, the two of these, harms and inherency. But inherency is just what is happening in the present moment that prevents your problem from being solved. So, and this, it, just to give a basic example of what this could look like is that if we say that um, in this, let's say, let's, let's pull, pull the body cams affirmative or something like that. So what is happening right now that would prevent us from, uh, from, from body cam from happening in the way that the 1AC might produce? Well, there's a ton of reasons, right? That there's not a uniform federal policy saying that police need to be wearing body cameras. Or another reason why the affirmative isn't happening is because there's not funding uh, that, that can be generated in small local municipalities. Uh, body cameras cost a lot of money. And so if there's not a, a funding mechanism to be able to perform the plan, it doesn't get done. So that's a, that will be co considered an example of inherency. The problems that exist in the status quo that are subsequently resolved by the action of the plan. We'll get back that to that with solvency. Topicality. Topicality is a fourth one. This is an important one for the two, the first two that we talked about before, the creative, the creative shits and the, the traditional shits. Is that it's important for you to have some kind of relationality to the topic. This particular definition or, or I guess description is most relevant for the traditional shits. Does your case fall within the topic? Um, and traditionally, when people say, does it fall within the topic, it's connected to what the, the resolution, the paper, the winning resolutional paper was for that school year. So what was, a, what, what, what was a, the phrasing of the resolution and what was the intent of the people who created the resolution for the 2020, 2021 school year. Oops, went ahead. Um, and 
it, now this is this is a one that is a bit subjective. I think that all of these significant harms inherent in topicality and solvency are often are are all subjective. But I think that topicality is often most subjective simply because determining the, if it meets the parameters of the resolution is contingent on what is said by the debaters in the round and by the perspective and biases of the judge. Um, so everybody is kind of a stakeholder in that situation. And so the judge may have a perspective that is different from conversations that are falling within the round that can affect if you're considered topical, if you fall within the discussion of the topic. It's really important to remember this because you may have a judge who considers you to be within the confines of the topic, so you'll win topicality in that debate. But sometimes you also have people who are predisposed against that and don't believe that your particular interpretation of the topic is correct and thus would not be considered topical. Now, the, the caveat is, or the caveat or the alternative is when you have a judge who doesn't think that you fall necessarily within the topic, but think that the affirmative produces a relevant education about the topic that is enough for you to be having a meaningful debate on for this year's uh, resolution. Um, and that would be in a judge who is friendly toward the creative shits. Um, the last as aspect of the basic stock issues is solvency. Super important, but similar to topicality, I would say that this is probably the second most subjective of how um, uh, affirmatives will, are, are, are viewed and evaluated and created in policy debate at both the high school and the college level, mostly because solvency suggests that there has to be um, well, there are different ways that people uh, like decide on if a job has been completed or not. So let's, let me put it, let me give you an example. So if you went to the hair salon and you brought in a picture, you said, hey girl, um, I want to get my hair braided like this. <laughs> like I want this particular style and do you think you can do this? You know what? Alexis says, definitely can. I can do that style. I feel confident in my ability to do that style. Have a seat in my chair. So you sit in Alexis' chair. Alexis is supposed to solve your problem of giving you the hairstyle that you want to achieve. Alexis has claimed that she has the ability to provide you that style. Now, you two, at the end of her providing that style, may have different interpretation on if she has done that job or not. You may look at that picture that you provided and then look at what the service is that is rendered for you and say, you did not braid my hair how I asked, you did something else, right? Like if you think that, the, that they're supposed to be um, smaller sizes of the braids, but you don't know how small, but you just think that they should be smaller. And she thinks that, she thinks that they're the exact same size as the picture that you showed her. Um, and it's just not up to scale because it's a picture on the phone. Then you have different interpretations of if she solved your problem or if she did not. You may feel that she did not because you believe that the picture uh, looks different from what the so services that she rendered. And she may believe that she provided you the services um, that, that you asked for. And so that's kind of how people can view solvency, how solvency is, is typically kind of debated in a lot of ways, that it's sometimes a question of perspective and not wholly about what happens on the flow. So we know that there's technical forms of debate where we go line by line, where if there is more of a uh, advantage on per the arguments on the flow and arguments that were responded to persuasively versus holistic debate where it's not necessarily is there a do you do I respond to every word you say um, in a one-to-one -one ratio but I holistically or in the big picture of things saying that um, this is how you would resolve this resolve this problem so okay so solvency and topicality are, are two of the more subjective ones that you really want to be aware of when you're evaluating not only how you create your affirmative, but how other people see it, and then how you read other people's uh, for solvency and topicality. Those are those are those subjective guys. All right. So let's let's just get into how do these sociocultural values influence how affirmatives are 
created, evaluated, debated, and defeated. Okay? Uh, we know that the sociocultural values are the following, the different groups of people who make up debate, the tradition of affirmatives for these groups, and then the, the overall habits of, of, of affirmatives. Those are the sociocultural values. So when I'm asking the question of how do these sociocultural values influence how affirmatives are created, let's try to go, let's make sure that we're applying these three standards to how we think about what goes into the makings of an affirmative. So let's just kind of discuss this out between the three of us since it's only us on this particular call and hopefully this will be helpful to the other students. How do you think the social cultural factors that we talked about affect how affirmatives are created? Max, you want to take it away for us, or do you want me to start answering that question? Well, I guess what I was going to kind of say is because of sociocultural factors that kind of affects the affirmative's experience, and so kind of like how they would interpret certain things, which would kind of affect how they would shape their argument for a certain topic. Okay. So the affirmatives, affirmatives are created with biases. I'm, I'm trying to just summarize and you let me know if this is an accurate characterization of what you said. Affirmatives are created with biases that reflect the, and let's go back to this slide so that we can keep everything together together the different pers the perspectives of different groups of people the tradition their traditions and their habits yeah the different groups of people in debate their traditional upbringing in debate and all right let's move on to the second one um how do you think that the socioculture factors of, how do you think that socioculture, that should be that, there we go. I was wondering why I was reading it. How do you think that sociocultural factors affect how affirmatives are evaluated? And by evaluated, I mean reviewed by judges, reviewed by um, the teams who are the ones creating their affirmatives, and then also reviewed by the people who will be competing against them. What do you think are the factors, like how would you describe the, those socioculture factors that we talked about, which just to reference again, are these the category, the types of people, the traditions of these people, the traditional upbringing of these people, and then the habits. Mm -hmm. So how do you think that these might contribute to how they are evaluated, like when you're reviewing them? I'll take a, so that Max is not the only person talking, I'll say some things too. Max, I got you, we're in this together. Um, <laughs> but I think in many ways of what was said about the kind of how, uh, how do sociocultural factors affect how affirmatives are created, um, very much so in the same way that they are evaluated, that there are biases um, that can be built based off of um, how someone is raised, how someone has been trained to not only learn, um, but relate to individuals in an activity uh, affects how they receive the information, especially if that information is coming from individuals who have very differing um, socioeconomic, sociocultural uh, backgrounds from them. I think that we see this at the level of not only miscommunication, right? Um, but I think also perhaps um, assimilation. Mm -hmm. And so 
I think that that matters uh, when we're kind of thinking of evaluation in debate as being objective, as being tabula rasa, as we like to say. And if for those who are watching and then for Max, if you're wondering what do I mean by tabula rasa, uh, judges love to say this sometimes as I have no biases. I will judge whatever comes into the round to my most objective position. All right, why? There's no, that it just simply doesn't exist. Um, and that's fine, right? In the context of we are acknowledging that there are sociocultural factors that do impede the ability for judges to evaluate um, arguments as neutral and objective. The issue, I believe, is that some individuals have not had to interact with difference as much to accept, perhaps, that what their understandings of the world and how they receive information um, has been built through a privilege of having to deal with um, different socio-cultural, economic factors. Um, so I think that all of that would be my response to how do I think that this affects how affirmatives are evaluated? I think it's exactly that, that we have judges slash affirmatives in general are evaluated through a biased lens that is affected by um, the socio-cultural backgrounds of the judges. They are not blocks, they are not robots, they are humans and they are humans who have gone through some life things and have perspectives that are informed through their schooling processes, through their how they were raised processes, and also the potential hubris or arrogance that comes with being an intellectual, right? That I can be tabula rasa. I am so smart and above my own you know, humanity that I will not let any of those things impede how I evaluate debate. That is probably the status quo sometimes, right? Where we like to posture that, um, but that is not the reality. And so that is what the affirmative, in all affirmatives, um, some more than others uh, deal with when entering into debate and asking the question of how should the affirmative be evaluated? I like that, that answer, Jasmine, that was really comprehensive. A lot of, a lot of debates have been judged of mine a lot of the times dealing with this exact question of how is it that you evaluated this debate? And then, Here's the part where it just really messes you up. That same question years later, being asked to you, how do you evaluate this debate? And can you look me in the face and vote this particular way? And you know, I've had to look at my flow, look back up and say, yes, I can look you in the face and say that I vote this way. And am I affected by my <laughs> background in debate and my personal background oh yeah oh yeah i am all right let's move on to the to the to the third question we're almost done and then we'll move on to the section two of this conversation which is how do you think that this how do you think that so i'm I, we always need to be that so i'm gonna just do that real quick how do you think that sociocultural factors affect how affirmatives in our debated so again of the two previous ones but you know based on your and traditions and habits and all those you may emphasize certain things more than others in your arguments because you feel that they're more important to you and therefore should be more important to everybody else so because you have bias you will emphasize certain things that may not be as impactful to other people So based on your traditions and habits related to how you were raised and upbringing in debate, can you finish that sentence out for me? Um, your arguments will emphasize certain aspects 
more than others because they resonate more with you? I see right there. I guess maybe it'd be smarter to start with the resonation since. Hmm. More. Hmm. All right, we're on the last one. So I, I I'll take this one so that you all don't have to have to just keep throwing it throwing it between the two of you. I'll take this last one. So how do you think that the social culture? How do you think that sociocultural factors affect how affirmatives are defeated? Now this one is particularly important to me because if for us to kind of determine how these are defeated, I think that it will be important to know what are the beliefs of what a an affirmative has to have. So even if we have different opinions on what on what we think that they should have for many people the belief is that an affirmative must have inherency significance solvency and harm given that understanding that they must have at least these four aspects of the stock issue these four significance how significant the problem is that we're trying to remedy um, why the plan is needed right now, uh, what is happening in the status quo that is preventing the problem from being solved on its own, and how exactly does the affirmative solve the problem, given those four aspects are crucial in terms of what are considered the requirements of being in an affirmative, then for, this, for, these affirm, for an affirmative to be defeated, I would say that the suggest that I would say that it must not have, it must be missing one or more of inherency, solvency, uh, significance, or harm. And this is just on the basic levels of um, competition. This isn't about the nuance of every debate, because obviously your flow matters, uh, how, how the debate evolves matters to determine if the, if the affirmative will win or if the negative will win. But what are considered traditionally like that it's not a full affirmative, um, it makes you most accessible, uh, susceptible to be defeated is for an affirmative to be missing one or more of the following. Solvency. Actually, I'll start out with the inherency, solvency, significance, and harm. Okay. And I'll share this out with everyone after, um, and it'll be in the student folder, and then you'll go, you go to the students folder, you'll go to either JV or varsity, we both have, we'll have it, go to week four, you'll be able to access this document from right there. I'll also, um, if, you, if you need it and you still are having a hard time finding it, just shoot me an email and I can send you a link to both the PowerPoint and the Word document that we worked on today. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to Jasmine now so we can get into part two. Awesome, all right. So I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna get into talking about this arm. Okay, let me make some things visual. Ooh, let me... Where am I? Okay, wait a second. Wait a second. Let me share the screen first. Share screen. Ba -ba -ba. Share. All right, so we can all see this. Perfect. Play from start. Making sure that we can all still see the screen. It's in full effect. Awesome. So 
Um, we're going to apply this to the packet. I think that Brooke did an excellent job in discussing what are the kind of components of what makes being affirmative uh, being affirmative. It is what 50% of your debates will be, give or take your choice in elims of kind of where you decide to see yourself. Um, but in the context of you got to be AF sometimes and you got to be next sometimes, you cannot avoid being affirmative. So we thought what better way to deal with that reality than to have a lecture about being AF. So you've heard the what are the components um, and things to consider in terms of not only the stock issue, um, stock issue points and how arguments are evaluated and being reflective about that, you're now probably wondering how can I apply that to the specific evidence packet um, that Bottle has put out? a great question and I'm here to potentially answer all of these things for you. So the first is that I've said this largely, so we're locked in, you're prepared, you're ready, let's go. So we have three objectives in this um, presentation. The first is that students will be able to identify the parts of an affirmative packet or what identify the parts of an affirmative with the bottle packet. I cannot read, but I hope that y'all can rock with me because, hey, reading is a process and a journey. Uh, the second objective is students will understand the distinction between the burden of proof and the burden of rejoinder. Third is that students will be assigned to highlight the 1AC and have that prepared by the next practice. Now, Max, and this is where I break away and I talk to you. That is your homework, highlighting the 1AC and being reflective and being kind of uh, critically uh, engaged in the things that I'm going to discuss to look for more areas of the kind of stock issues where you think it's important uh, to highlight because that'll move into a lot of the things that we discussed from, um, next week, um, furthering the conversation of this debate and the packet. So yeah, those are the three um, objectives. So we are going to move through them. So topicality. Um, I remember from Brooks a uh, very good conversation about this and I need to kind of preface before I jump into an affirmative um, must be topical is that that is something that is highly refuted um, or at least critically spun. So like what does it mean to be topical why should affirmatives be topical? Um, and so this is a debate that happens um, that doesn't look like an affirmative that abides by the normative call of the United States federal government should enact a hypothetical plan of action, um, but rather that an affirmative ought not take that form at all as a um, reduction in the harms that the resolution attempts to solve for. So if the resolution is like, uh, we can discuss CJR, right, and all the bad things that CJR does, a affirmative, which we call a critical affirmative, might take the approach of instead of saying the United States federal government should mandate or enact a reform that gets rid of ICE, for example, um, that we should just be critical dissenters of capitalism that would structure or challenge and uh, restructure the ways in which we think of rehabilitation and care and just institutions proper. There is a debate as to whether or not the affirmative gets to have those things. And to do that, um, and that is slightly different than topicality, that is framework. I am just prefacing these things so that you take what I say with a grain of salt and not as a universalism, as this is what all affirmatives um, ought to look like or defend, but that in the context of the bottle packet, topicality is a conversation that we can have. So what part of the resolution does this meet? And, you know, we can look at the answer uh, to this um, in terms of the next side of it, but there's also part of it that does not have the answer. Um, in that the plan text is 
the United States federal government should defund and disband immigration and custom enforcement. That's the short, or that's the long hand for ICE. Now, there are three areas of the, resol or the resolution. There is sentencing, policing, and forensic science. Um, and then uh, other questions that I have that are words in the resolution is a substantial reform and the word reform itself. If we are thinking with our big wig caps on about T um, and the first kind of threshold that an F that attempts to be topical must uh, meet is, did it meet the resolution? And so Max, you're here, you get to think about these things right on hand. Uh, what about this plan text? What topic, what topic area do you think that it is focused on? Can you rephrase that? Or I just like heard it wrong. Yeah, so we have the plan text for the Abolish ICE app. And there are three topic areas. There's sentencing, so a reform in sentencing, a reform in policing, and a reform in forensic science. Which of the three topic areas do you think that abolishing ICE would fall under? Uh, and the, policing? Okay, excellent answer, excellent answer. And something that I want folks to know, and also you, Max, I'm just doing this like YouTube Max moment, um, is that the way in which the resolution is worded is that the affirmative doesn't have to be just one topic area, it could be all of them. Um, so that it could be an affirmative that has something to do with sentencing, something to do with policing, and something to do with forensic science. So just wanted to add that, but you are indeed, indeed, correct that this affirmative focuses on the policing tenant um, as we'll get more in discussing the F you will see why but excellent excellent response um, other questions is is it a substantial reform right is abolishing ice um, substantial enough to meet what the resolution would say that the United States federal government should enact a substantial reform um, in the criminal justice system in one of the in, in one of the two the three following areas, right? Um, do you think that abolishing ICE meets that kind of T substantial? Do you think that that is a large enough controversy? Yeah, I think so. What's the well, what's the you know because this, this is where T debates could happen, right? where the yeah. negative could say, well, no, this is not substantial. What was the hmm, ha huh, moment? So I think that, you know, it's a little bit of a hmm, ha, huh, because I mean, ICE is not all police. It has a very specific role. So although it has a pretty big impact, especially in America, maybe it could be seen as this in the grand scheme of things isn't as big as like general police forces or something like that. Okay. So what I heard is the impact of the affirmative um, might be large, but that the role um, of ICE or kind of the size of the agency in relationship to all of police might not be as big or kind of what the topic is as focused on. Um, am I hearing that right? Is that kind of where, where we're at? Okay, and that's definitely a debate as to kind of the impacts of the affirmative, i.e. what is the impact of ICE versus how large of a role kind of federally um, does ICE play in the larger context of how the topic wants to discuss policing. Um, and it's all about what is the topic set up to, to create that fair division of ground for the affirmative and negative. Um, so yeah, excellent. Um, and do you think that is a reform? Do you think that abolishing ICE is a reform? I think it's an abolishment. But, <laughs> so are you saying that you do not think it is a reform? Or, no. and this is, the, this is where, you know, we get kind of ticky tack with words, um, but do you think that abolishing ICE is a reform to the criminal justice system? Or do you think it's not a reform? I think it is a reform, yeah, because if we're talking about a part of it, then you're changing it because you're taking one part away. That's still changed, so therefore I'd consider it reform, yes. Okay, 
And like that is definitely a debate that occurs as to whether or not abolition is a reform, right? Um, or if abolition does not provide or because how we how the word reform can be defined is that it is a change to a program, not um, but that that program may stay in place, but that there are components of it that still remain the same because it still has value. Um, that would be the debate versus abolition, right? That completely guts takes out a program or system, uh, which at that point, there might be some arguments as to why by the affirmative abolishing a program, it might take some ground away from, from the negative where their links might be predicated more off of a program still existing, right? Versus a program being completely taken away. Like what is the controversy over reforming ICE, right? versus abolishing ICE, um, if we're thinking maybe about an elections decide, right? Um, but at that point, maybe the link argument might not be, what might not matter as much, uh, because anything as it relates to ICE seems to create controversy um, in politics. So, um, inherency. Um, what is stopping the plan from happening in the status quo? Is this plan, we're not speaking universally, we're talking about this app, likely to occur right now. Brooke talked about inherency earlier. I'm here to make it relate to the plan. Stop. Something that's important to note um, about kind of the inherent barrier is that it can be both legal, uh, legislative slash a legal inherency barrier and also attitudinal, right? Like what are the kind of attitudes uh, within politics or kind of how a particular policy is felt by society that makes it more likely or makes it less likely that it will be received in a way that requires for the policy to be um, passed. This is why we have things like fiat, right, which change, and this could be a word that everyone's like, what did you just say? What is happening? It's all right. It's okay. Fiat is merely just a question of um, should the plan happen as it relates to the affirmative being able to resolve its impact or that the way in which the affirmative attempts to resolve its impact, should the plan happen on that level, not will the plan happen, right? Like, because the debate would really stop if somebody wrote, wrote an inherent, or not an inherency argument, but just an argument about Oh, they would never pass a plan like this. So we're not even going to discuss this as an affirmative that could solve anything. Fiat allows for the debate to leave the realm of would the plan pass, yes or no, to, okay, when the plan does pass, what are the consequences to that that might mean that the plan should not be endorsed? Is everyone with me? Does that make sense? Awesome. Fiat. It's debatable. So, um, opposition to abolition. This is going to be the inherency argument for abolish ICE. Um, Max, do you want to read that for us? Sure. Though ICE abolition is spreading on the left, it quickly meets extreme skepticism elsewhere. In part, this is because the mainstream political discourse has a huge blind spot for the agency's increasingly brutal policies. While elites have generally become concerned with rising authoritarianism, they have mainly ignored the purges ICE is conducting in immigrant communities. For example, in the recent book, How Democracies Die, Daniel Ziblatt and Stephen Le Levetsky do not mention ICE at all. Centrist pundits like Jonathan Chait have dedicated thousands of words to the threat of peace culture on college campuses, but haven't found time to question whether an you know, opaque and racist deportation force might pose a larger threat to democracy than campus editorial pages. Others tend to dismiss ICE abolition as more of a troll than a serious policy demand. Josh Barrow, a senior editor at the Business Insider, argued that progressives have not paired the proposal with a plan to do the function without the hated agency. All right, so can we see how that would be the inherency argument? Um, oops, sorry. Oops. 
my bad. The inherency argument for abolish ice, right? That there is stuff that is in the in there is stuff in the status quo that is blocking the plan from passing now, right? Um, and this goes back to what Brooke was discussing earlier, right? That we wouldn't be debating an AF that is like happening right now because there's no value in saying a plan should happen if a plan is already happening, right? There's then there's no reason to do the plan at all. Uh, so there has to be something that is barring the plan from occurring. And as we can see with the Abolish ICE Act, that there's definitely a both cultural argument, maybe a sociocultural argument, right, for um, why um, politicians and just in general individuals in society don't look at Abolish ICE as having a legitimate chance of um, happening, um, or two, that folks just don't know the realities of kind of what ICE does, and so therefore they're not prone to care or even to think critically about uh, solutions towards getting rid of the program if they don't know, one, the program exists, two, how bad the program is, uh, and three, if there are even probabilistic ways to resolving um, the problem. And that's where the plan sits, right, is that there are either people who don't want to, folks who don't know how to, or folks who don't even know that this is a controversy occurring. And so this problem remains latent um, and happening behind closed doors. And we just continue to have the problems that we do. Um, so that is the opposition to abolition, right? So solvency. We talked about solvency with Brooke. Let's apply it to the plan. So. Disband so in the evidence, and I, maybe I should have said that earlier, all of these citations that have these kind of underlying moments, these are all citations in the 1AC bottle evidence. Um, in my creating of this PowerPoint, I may have forgotten to indicate which card, but that just makes this even more fun because it means that when you do get to this, when you highlight or read and highlight the 1AC, you can be like, wow, this looks familiar. Why is that? because we went over this in this meeting and also the lecture. Um, all right, so disband the agency. The Trump's deportation squad should cease to exist. Immigration enforcement as we know it should end. What this means in practice, a moratorium on deportations, the end of all immigration detention, the reimagining of the Border Patrol as a humanitarian force that rescues migrants rather than destroying their water supplies to hasten their deaths. Border Patrol could be staffed by emergency service experts and healthcare workers, not police. We need to establish, oops, I am touching too many things. We need to establish a Truth and reconcil Reconciliation Commission to examine the abuses perpetuated by Homeland Security agencies, ICE, CBP, UCA, USCIS, um, which is the predecessor of ICE, um, just so that you all know, there was a immigration enforcement before ICE um, existed, um, and that, that kind of upkeeps the things that ICE is not in control of. ICE is more focused on the policing apparatus uh, so bringing folks back to the border, um, then all of kind of comprehensive immigration reform as we deal with data on immigrants, visas, protocols, and all of that stuff. So we need reparations distributed to the millions who have been terrorized by ICE. So this is part of a solvency card. I won't tell you which one of the 1AC, but it's part of a solvency card of the AF. This is how the plan, um, would solve. It would disband the agency, uh, establish a moratorium on all deportations. It would actively work against this belief that um, we are, uh, that the Border Patrol is a humanitarian force um, that's rescuing migrants um, and all these different things to get us to accepting, one, that ICE is bad, and two, that nothing else can be accepted than abolition. This is probably setting the affirmative up to respond to the debate of abolition is insufficient or abolition is too much of a um, beautiful idea than it is pragmatic. Um, the affirmative, and maybe Max, you can agree with me here, is that their argument would be that's part of the inherency argument, right? 
that kind of attitudinal inherency of, oh, it's not sufficient enough, or oh, that's a big dream to think of getting rid of ICE. The affirmative would say, and part of their solvency, is that, the, the, that abolishing ICE is key to getting to this new critical space for reimagining um, and changing the way in which we understand border patrol because it is arguments like what the negative will say about sufficiency and why abolition won't work and all of these things that allow for it to continue. So yeah, that is uh, stuff on solvency. Harms, I don't know why I have a T there, so we're just gonna ignore that T. That T is just there for fun and for free. Um, so harms. Harms are the impacts, the bad things that are happening in the status quo, or that could potentially happen in the status quo. Y'all didn't know you were about to get bars, but you just got them. You're welcome. So um, these are the negative things that are happening in the status quo. I don't know why I spelled quo, S-Q-O. But once again, uh, we're just gonna believe and trust that I know how to read and now I apparently know how to write. Uh, these are the negative things that are happening in the squo slash can continue, that could or are on the brink of happening in the squo. The reason why um, it can be both is it depends on what the affirmative is structured to respond to. We have affirmatives that are more um, composed to deal with existential risk framing. And so what I mean by that is affirmatives that are reading like nuclear war as an impact um, or like bioterrorism as an impact. Things like this. You might be wondering what scenario on this topic could ever get us to bioterrorism or nuclear war? Trust me, there are several that are linked to a lot of different apps. Would you call them a reach? I would, but that's up to you. Um, but there are apps that are geared towards that kind of framing. And then there are apps that are more soft left in practice. The affirmative would be seen as an app that is more soft left. And so the impacts are not ones that are likely to occur. They are impacts that are occurring right now, right? Um, but that, are not seen as being, oh, this big boom, irreversible impact. And so therefore they're seen as, there's more time to deal with it. Yes, racism is bad. Yes, you know, socioeconomic divide and poverty is bad. But you know what's worse? Big boom, nuclear war, can't come back from that because we're all dead, right? Like big boom, climate change and the, uh, what is it, the nuclear winter, not nuclear winter, because that would be from nuclear war, insert all the arguments about how clouds and the sulfur and the air creates this cooling temperature, not good for us, boom, dead. Or usually it's like climate change. Climate change can be seen as being a soft left impact, but sometimes it's used as a, it's a bigger impact because the world is declining. All the impacts of like racism and poverty are going to be affected too. But uh, that's the reason why I say either negative things that are happening in the status quo, right? So that's going to be your systematic oppression type impacts or uh, negative things that are going to happen in the squo if things do not change. When you hear things do not change, you should hear if the plan doesn't pass. So if we do not do the plan. So things that are happening in the squo in the context of the app that are bad are that ICE is breaking up families pretty bad, right? Uh, the brutal deportation process, you know, pretty bad. Uh, unlawful detention of individuals by ICE officers, you know, not too nice. I wouldn't, I would want that to be my reality. And once again, a quote from the evidence. So you get a gold star if you're like, oh, reading the app evidence, you're like, whoa, why is this familiar? Because you watch the PowerPoint and you know what's happening. Uh, and that is ICE is terrorizing American communities right now. Um, said Angela Padilla, policy director of the Indivisible Project. They're going into schools, entering hospitals, conducting massive raids, and separating children from parents every day. We are funding those activities, and we need to use all the leverage we have to stop it. So a very systematic violence impact 
is being set up by this affirmative, not one that resides on existential risk framing because of the universal impacts that are happening right now, but are seen as being so low magnitude that nobody either A, cares, or B, they're always pushed off uh, in the context of, but like, what about this war that could take place, right? The question becomes, when do we prioritize certain impacts over others, and why maybe is it important to prioritize the ass impact? Uh, next slide. Significance. I'm getting these significance. This is where we get into necessary and sufficient conditions. This might be something where you're like, huh, what, Jasmine, what's going on? I'm here, I got you. Does the app's impacts meet the necessary and sufficient conditions test? And I'm gonna break, I'm gonna break up what that means. Um, so actually before, you know, you know, we'll stare at that while I describe what I mean by this because I feel like it already takes up a lot of space. So we're just gonna let it take up space while I discuss this. So necessary and uh, sufficient conditions. The affirmative, um, actually, I think I described since the next slide. So one is the F passes the test. Uh, I'll explain why I wrote this here uh, as to why the app passes the test, but I think that you can um, understand this. Oh my gosh, my hands. Through the McElwee evidence, this is the first piece of evidence in the 1AC that talks about the uh, deportations and the forced separation of families and kind of the legacy of kind of cap, um, cap, cap, capturing and detaining bodies as a legacy of colonization and uh, or co colonialism, my bad, and um, anti-blackness, anti-black racism, and things of the sort, right, that these are embedded within a white supremacist structure, uh, that we have believed that there are some folks that can be dehumanized, and that is justified by a citizenship status. So that would be like the impact argument, right, of the affirmative, that we allow for that insidious um, violence to occur that is traced in a longer legacy of white supremacy. That is the big kind of big, big significance argument that the affirmative is making. Um, so yes, it's on a sun, I'm like, you know, it's a setting. But does the app meet the test? I would say that it does. It says, this is another quote from the affirmative, is that I reject the racist and outdated premises that we need to treat immigration as a national security threat, that any immigrant immigration status could be, should be criminalized, and that any human being is illegal. The fact that Democrats refuse to join me in rejecting these premises demonstrates just how far right our normal is in American politics. It's a little bit of attitudinal inherency in there, if you can see it, right? Uh, is there that inability to reconcile, reflect, and maybe engage in a radical of politics to uh, refuse and reject um, uh, racist policies? And as we're seeing, right, this is not something that is uh, a bipartisan issue, right? Like this is not something that is uniquely just bad for Republicans, but it's an equal debate as to what are the interests for Republicans and Democrats for how they view comprehensive immigration reform. What's stopping them from taking that next step to abolish ICE if it is indeed one that is in steeped in racist and outdated premises? So, Pause. Uh, does the F's solvency mechanism meet the test? So this is where I'm going to stop real quick because we're almost done. I didn't make this slide too large uh, or the, the presentation too large. It's that the impact that the affirmative has has to meet the necessary and sufficient condition. And so necessary would be like, is it 100% needed to solve for the F's impact. Like, for example, if the affirmative were to have, you know, read an F and then the impact is something low risk, like, I'm trying to think of an impact that's like not necessarily, we need to solve it right now. Um, but I'll just give an example of like a debate that happens. There's the, um, collapse of 
the financial market and then there's, I don't know, let's just say poverty. Mm, no, those are too close. Let's say poverty versus nuclear war. Um, mm, actually, no. Let's do just not even a versus versus. Let's just say the impact is, as you can see, I've not really thought of an impact that doesn't matter, because they all seem to matter in debate, is no more chocolate, right? Like, I know this might sound silly, but like chocolate is gone. I know, I don't like chocolate, so that doesn't really affect me. Um, but let's just say the impact is chocolate will be gone forever. Now, the question could be negative, it's all right, let's say the plan solves, like it solves its impact. Is it really necessary that we solve for that impact right now in response to whatever the negative impact is uh, that the affirmative causes? Is it necessary for the, like, does the app meet the necessary? Because if it doesn't, it means that we probably could solve for a different impact now and resolve the other later. Is the app sufficient? Right? And that's where we get into um, this part here. It's does the F solvency mechanism meet the test? Is it's one, is the affirmative, the plan, necessary to solve its impact? Right? Is there a relationship between abolition, right, and its ability to resolve kind of white supremacy? and kind of traces of anti-blackness, right? Is the affirmative able to solve for that impact? And is the plan sufficient at being able to solve its impacts? This is where the debate on this packet is happening. The affirmative will have an impact that is quite grandiose, right, and true, that resolving, you know, deportations and solving for unlawful separations of families and detainments and all of that are traces in white supremacy and traces in colonialism and will claim to resolve or at least be in the direction of resolving that impact. Something that is asked of the, um, affirm asked by the negative to the affirmative is that's a big impact, right? No one affirmative is going to resolve that in and of itself, by itself, right? Because colonialism, white supremacy, all those things exist in a whole bunch of different places. And while y'all, make sure, sure that y'all don't hear my do not disturb moment, I'm gonna get rid of these notifications so that y'all don't have to hear that because I don't want to hear it. Okay, um, there we go, back to this. Um, is that the affirmative has a big impact but what is the affirmative's relationship to being a sufficient one, right? I.e. the impact is bad, but how best able is the affirmative to resolve that, um, et cetera, et cetera. Which brings me to the burden of proof and the burden of rejoinder. Which does the F have? What do you think, Max? Does the F have the burden of proof or the burden of rejoinder? It can only be one. This is not, not like a, oh, it could be either one. It is quite literally one. Does the act of the burden of joinder or the burden of proof? You got a 50 50 chance of getting it right. I'm not sure. But you got a 50 50 chance of quick guessing. You got 100% so chance. The... <laughs> burden of proof. I will guess. And we're joined. Burden of proof. And the verdict is in. Max. You are correct. Yes, the affirmative has the burden of proof. Look at us learning. Yes, and if you guessed at home, burden of proof, you get the validation the that you are amazing <laughs> and that you are learning to be because I have not so one thing that I can present to you physically right now, social distance, but I'm proud of you. All right? All right. Okay, one sec. Answer the phone, decline the phone. Awesome. Yes, the affirmative has the burden of proof um, for reasons why, and then we're done. 
One, is the AF is more than the plan text and an impact. Could you imagine the AF gets up and says the United States federal government should enact a criminal justice reform by abolishing ICE um, and then reads a card that's like colonialism bad and racism is bad? I have questions. I got some big questions. And the large one is, how does the affirmative resolve that impact? What is the particular scenario through which the affirmative is resolving that impact? And can the affirmative resolve that impact? That is why the burden of proof question is so important. It's because the affirmative has to prove significance. I will say that one more time. The affirmative has to prove significance in either a necessary condition or a sufficient condition, depending on how the affirmative is structured. In the context of this affirmative, you are providing both a necessary and sufficient. Uh, necessary in the context of we should only be geared towards abolition because the impacts are linear and only getting worse, right? Not that the impacts have not occurred yet, and there's a risk that they do, they are happening. We are seeing them, or people are ignoring them, right? So there is a necessary, we need to do something now, right? But there's also a sufficiency argument that the affirmative is making, that abolition might not be perfect, or it might not solve everything, but it is the only and best step in creating a big enough impact to resolve the um, 1AC harm. With me, S necessary and sufficient condition. The AF has a burden of proving that, while the negative has the burden of rejoinder. We'll get more into that, but literally think of it this way. The negative has the burden to respond to the AF. You gotta prove the AF is bad in some way or the AF does not do the thing that they have, like you wait for the AF to happen, and then you begin to ask these questions of, hmm, if you have the burden of proof, I am the negative, I am here to prove why the AF does not meet that burden. So the last two things, um, or well, the three things, I've said them, but just so that we get to the itemization of what I wrote, is that debates would be short and lack complexity, an engagement if all the affirmative had to do was when their impact was the biggest and baddest on the block. We would just be yelling at each other, warming, nuclear war. All right, like, yes, these are impacts, but I don't know what is happening for how the affirmative resolves them and why resolving them is a good thing, right? Um, the next is that the app has to win proof, right, burden of proof, that its solvency mechanism is able to solve for the impact. This includes uniqueness, the link argument, right, so why plan key, the internal link chain, so what the plan solves for and why solving for that is able to resolve the impact of the particular advantage. This app only has one advantage, and that is uh, you can call it by many names, but you can call it either it resolves colonialism, white supremacy, or anti-Black policies. That is kind of the impact systematic racism. That is the impact of the act. And so, does the Abolish ICE Act meet that burden? Hopefully it does, as I compose this 1AC, to have a burden of proof that it has some necessary and sufficient conditions to do that, but that it's open to contestation, open to contestation for why maybe abolishing ICE in the way the affirmative does might not be the most viable option or has consequences that could potentially cause for um, magnified impacts within the scope of what the plan has already said is bad. You will know what I mean as you read more through the bottle evidence. So take this as an ominous sequitur of dot, dot, dot. And the homework, 
for folks who will be here next week and for you, Max, is to highlight the 1AC, read through it, think through burden of proof, think through the stock issues. And we will see you next week to discuss further how you're unpackaging that and maybe moving into some now we're negative. What are the roles of being negative? And with that, I think good day. <laughs>